Hola, hola. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Qué bueno verles a todos. Un gusto. Este, Michelle y Steven y Pari están enseñando en por Hollyhock este fin de semana. Entonces, Darín y yo les vamos a cuidar, enseñar, guiar un poco. Jesse, estás hablando en español. Oh, caramba. Creo que decidimos hacerlo en español. <risa> no. ah. <risa> bueno, es que han escuchado tantas veces la misma cosa, ¿no? Y ahora a lo mejor pueden entender de una otra manera. Vamos a ver. Well, we're just kidding. I had the thought. We try it out. See how it went. <laughs> uh, but good to be here with you all. Um, and uh, yeah, really wonderful. So, you know, uh, Steve and Michelle and Pari are all at the Hollyhock uh, weekend retreat. So Darina and I are gonna uh, be with you today. And yeah, just really looking forward to uh, being together, sitting together uh, in this Dhamma space. So I was just um, saying, I was having a little hard time getting on the Facebook thing. I was gonna, that's why we're a little late. I was just, I'll try again. For some reason, it's um, yeah, it's not letting me. I'll just post it on later, since we're recording. Eileen is here. Hi, Eileen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> the Taos community. Ah, mm -hmm. Taos represent. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Darine, start us off. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, really lovely to see you uh, again and so let's just start um, finding the posture that will bring some stability some, some relaxation perhaps even some kindness And if it's helpful, you can start just touching your heart. And just feeling the physical connection. Perhaps feeling the qualities of heart. We're inclining the mind, making an, an intention. To be kind for whatever arises during the seat. Whether it's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. Or caring. for the unpleasant. We can start receiving sound, vibration, just as it is happening. Or the quiet.
internal sounds as well. Noticing the concept or an image of the sound, no problem. It's just that, it's just a concept. I'm receiving again the sounds appearing and disappearing by themselves. or receiving the sensations at the hand area, around the hands, inside the hands. Wherever it is the easiest or the most obvious, where you can feel directly physical sensations. Warm, cool, sweaty, tingly, vibrations light or heavy. or perhaps the breath, the movement as we breathe in, and feeling the sensations, receiving the sensations at the abdomen. Receiving the sensations as the breath goes out. without trying to manipulate, fix, or thinking that it should be different as it is. It's really shifting into just receiving and do nothing but accepting unconditionally as best as we can. And observing nature as it shifts 
arise, permanent arise and uh, exist and disappear. in the form of physical sensations or thoughts, emotions, mind states, breath, sound, smell, taste, touch, Sometimes opening up the attention to a wider field and receiving physical sensations throughout the body, just as they are. Like settling back and listening, feeling directly, not through the thought process, not through concepts. And if that happens, it's okay. We just recognize that that's just concepts. And we think back we drop into the body. A little bit deeper and deeper. making a space. I'm sorry if there is joy or worry, grieving. Feeling the emotion just as it is, and also feeling the correspondence in the body as physical sensations. We know that we can call up compassion or metta at any time. And see if, if there is any curiosity or interest in this moment. What's happening in this moment? It gets too complicated or confusing. Or intense. 
you can always find refuge in your anchor, which is mean, meant to be neutral. Resting.
Thank you for your practice. I didn't get a chance to look around at everyone yet. So I'll just, if anyone feel free to take the time to check out our Sangha for today. Thank you, Darine. And thanks so much um, to everyone, uh, but especially Darine and Amanda, Jake, Pari, who I don't, you know, who's over on the other retreat right now, and Steve, of course, for just, you know, um, holding everything uh, so well and beautifully. And and Michelle and I's absence uh, over the last few months, it's really been awesome to just know it was in good hands and every week see the recording was ready and just kind of, uh, or get the sense that everyone is just like having a really beautiful time again every Sunday. And, and just that sense of, you know, I, I've been holding so much of the technical stuff over the last year since COVID and just that feeling of like, okay, like I don't actually need to be the person holding it all the time. So just really wonderful. Amanda, especially just coming every weekend. Thank you so much. Really awesome. And, and wonderful just to have our, our um, broader, family, Dhamma family doing offerings. And, you know, of course, as I said last week, we, we hope that can continue in some ways um, that we'll see, you know, over the coming months uh, to share some of the, the Dhamma space here. And, and just thank everyone, you know, I think um, just keeping the momentum going and it's such a incredible gift to be able to take that time for me, you know, to practice and, um, you know, I, I take my part of the responsibility for doing that. And I also know that my capacity to do that is very much um, owed to a lot of people here in the Sangha, you know, to supporting me, supporting our livelihoods and, and this ability. And so um, it's just, it's wonderful to be able to, to have that time to practice I think sometimes coming back from retreat, I feel um, like a certain amount of pressure to to offer something like really <laughs> amazing, you know. Uh, it's like, it's mostly just an internal pressure, you know. Um, it's all, it's all the same. There's no new Dhamma, I'll give you that to start with, prepare yourself. <laughs> but I do, I do hope I can offer something that's, that's helpful and worthy of this tradition that we keep trying to, to realize and, and practice in and um, honor in our own lives. I think that's so much for me of, you know, a big piece of kind of what has come out. And I think always when I go on retreat, just that deepening and always powerful appreciation of how beautiful this path is and how um, totally possible awakening is in this way and this uh, the way that the Buddha realized and described and <clears throat> so many others have realized and helped us along the way with that it's entirely possible it's amazing and how hard it is you know just like how agonizing, how humbling, how just like incredibly mysterious and um, strange and sometimes really challenging it can be, you know, to, to really try to, to get to the heart of understanding of what's going on and, and the mind that is, um, so powerful and has so much capacity for love and insight and understanding. And is just not fully trained enough to be able to be with the relentless flow 
of uncontrollable conditions that's unfolding every moment. And, and because of that, reverts to all kinds of um, often very challenging patterns, you know, of greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, is the, is the way to sort of sum it up. But all of the, the clinging and grasping and rejecting and, and the, the notioning, the self, the, our perceptions and ideas and views of things that are um, such a powerful and, and often quite functional defense and, and sometimes really necessary and useful defenses for us against the way things actually are. And so just the, the courage that's needed, the patience that's needed, the compassion that's needed, the determination that's needed to just kind of keep seeing the mind and heart through this process um, always strikes me and still feels very fresh uh, right now for me. I still feel very sensitive to and awed by the the degree to which most i mean the just the vast majority of thought of 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 mental activity is really trying to just solidify that which is constantly falling apart trying to stabilize and secure and create a, a platform of perspective um, that's stable, uh, a position that's describable uh, in a flow of experience that's undescribable, that's overwhelming, that's in which no position is fixed, in which everything is constantly moving. It's amazing. You know, it really is something I know we can lose track of off of retreat often, you know, it's like we kind of get back into this the conceptual mode and how much we need to be thinking about stuff. But, but when we really look at how little of our thoughts are actually figuring things out, you know what I mean? Like, of course, the mind is incredible at being able to like think about things and, and wrestle with them and figure out problems and you know, it's incredible capacity for that. But that's not mostly what we're doing. I mean, mostly it's just this like constant reiteration of, of worries, of views, of, of fantasies, of perspectives, of opinions, of frameworks, of ideas, um, and that they, they're constantly collapsing. And so that we're constantly reaffirming them and shoring them back up. Um, at, as a way to create a sense of stability, the stability of meanness, the stability of you-ness, the stability of uh, society and our perspective on it, our view in the world or the universe. It is quite amazing. And, and this sense of how scared the mind heart must really be uh, about the fact that things are always changing, right? The Buddha's just fundamental teachings that everything is impermanent, everything is undependable. Uh, nothing has a core, solid, stable self. Mm. How terrifying that is actually to the mind that isn't just simply just doesn't have the experience, the training, the capacity of mindfulness, of concentration, of the dexterity of mind, all of these tools that we're always teaching the same, same things, you know, every week, every retreat, how, um, how terrifying that is for the mind when the equanimity isn't there, right? When the interest isn't there, when, and, 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 uh, what feels so much safer is our concepts, our beliefs, the structures that we impose on ourselves and impose on the world around us. And not that they're wrong, not that our views on things are wrong uh, or that these perspectives are wrong. It's, that isn't, it's like irrelevant whether they're right or wrong or how we might argue about them, how we might defend them, um, whether our analysis about X or Y thing is correct. It's like, that's, we can have conversations about whatever analysis, whatever framework we use to understand ourselves, to understand the universe, understand society. Those are meaningful, important conversations. What 
we see from the Dhamma side is that that understanding that it's not to say they're wrong or that they're right, but that the pattern of constantly needing them to stabilize our relationship with reality, to have our entire relationship with reality mediated by these views, by these fixations, by these needs to stabilize, by the anxiety for things to be one way or another is imprisoning us and imprisoning the world, imprisoning the universe, right? That there's a, it's, it's, it's irrelevant whether they're true or not right? It's that the mind is using those views, using these beliefs, using these ideas, using these thoughts, using these hatred, fantasy, desire, all of these things as a way to avoid the ultimate truths of everything constantly coming and going, everything, uh, there being no ground to stand on in our direct experience of moment to moment uh, sense you know, conjuring and passing away. And so there's this sense of like, oh, it's not to argue with ourselves about the views or that they're wrong or that we're, we shouldn't need them, but there's a tender, because there's a tenderness that needs to arise, a care of like, wow, the, how scared the mind must be about reality to be so fixated, to be so needing to, to, to solidify everything. And that it only stops doing it when it doesn't need to do it, right? That, that you can't force the mind to stop doing it. It's like we, we, we train the mind just as the instructions today. It's like you try to be with breathing non-conceptually. You try to be with the body non-conceptually, sound non-conceptually. We see concept assert itself over and over. And it's like, okay, we're training the attention to be okay with the rising and falling of the breath, with the coming and going of sounds, with the changing sensations of body, with seeing, smelling, tasting, uh, the mind itself entirely unstable. It takes that training, it takes the, per, uh, the, the protection, you know, of, of periods of practice, of um, a regular, as much as possible, this, you know, uh, cultivation of these qualities in our daily lives. And of course, you know, the more we can do intensive periods of retreat, the better, you know, the more protection we have, often there's uh, a deepening capacity for the, the mind heart to feel safe, to be okay with things as they are, to not need to constantly be fixating or conjuring these notions, or if they are arising, that it's okay, it's not a bother, right? We see this flood of mental fabrication, just as we do with sound or the body, it's okay, right? It's not actually, we get that it's not personal, it's conditioned, conditioned response to the undependability of things. One of the um, challenges of my time on retreat was, um, let's see, it was, maybe just a month beforehand, right? That the, um, the military, the Tamada in, in Myanmar, Burma, uh, you know, staged this coup to overthrow the democratically elected uh, government there. And so, you know, we've sent out emails and Facebook posts and I'm sure just to one degree or another, you all are aware of, uh, what's happening there, what's continuing to happen and, and some of our response and, and role in, in trying to galvanize, you know, goodness in that direction. But it was something that I didn't feel like I could just put away, you know, um, there was a, a momentum to our engagement. There is this interesting dance between, you know, I this practice and the, the value of seclusion <laughs> is something I learned in Burma, right? And the, the, the intense need to protect it and how important it is to be withdrawn and to not read the news and to protect the mind and heart in order to do this practice. And at the same time, that it was this lineage that I feel so indebted to that's, that's so powerfully under threat and the communities and cultures uh, there that you know protect, have protected these practices 
um, for so, so many years. Um, and, and of course, our friends that are there in the midst of this. And um, so I had to stay, I felt I needed to stay engaged to some degree. And it was very, um, difficult. Part of that would would entail, you know, going um, online maybe once a day. There was a couple, there was definitely probably that first month where it was almost every day where I felt like I had to check in, um, coordinate some of our fundraising stuff and speak to a friend on the ground who was kind of helping make all that happen. And so to go from, as you all know, this sort of quietude and the seclusion of not communicating, not working, not getting a lot of external data, you know, and, and information and stimulus, you know, are, are, we encourage a very strong um, kind of seclusion where, you know, even pleasant engagements or uh, things that we might enjoy, music or movies or whatever. It's like, we try to really kind of put things down and, and, and have this aspect of renunciation or really just absorbed in this process of trying to be with our direct experience, you know. So to go from most of my day being that and then, you know, in the evening going and just, it probably was only 15 minutes, but to, to watch, you know, videos of, um, just horrible, horrible atrocities, you know, of the military murdering people in the streets or the police being incredibly brutal, you know, with protesters and incredible violence and terror and fear and, you know, knowing that so many people that we care about are totally trapped in this context, feeling sometimes powerful and hopeful and sometimes feeling terrified and hopeless them and of course myself. And so that experience of kind of puncturing the protection with kind of basically like almost the worst thing I could probably be like ingesting, you know, um, was very incredibly difficult and disorienting, like, like, like nauseating, like that sense of just like, it's so, it's, it's the impact on the heart and mind is so, it was often so, um, yeah, confusing, disorienting, um, uh, sickening, right? And there was a very, um, I'd always do after that, just because of my kind of natural schedule, I would practice metta or Rama Vihara. And I was really amazed at um, how not how easy it actually was. You know, it's not always easy for me. It's not, it's certainly not always natural for me, this particular aspect where it was like in my practice, there was a very natural, very open, spacious sense of caring of compassion, of loving kindness um, for everyone in, in, in Myanmar and Burma, from the generals to the, you know, street police soldiers to the protesters to the villagers who are hiding, you know, the, the whole spectrum to our friends, who, the people who are running, the people who are fighting, all, all of it. It's like, there was a very, um, even surprising to me, natural just sense of, of total even compassion and care across the board for our people. Which was of course very moving and powerful and and also sometimes a little confusing. I don't always expect the heart to trust love that much to trust the truth of it to that degree. And I think right now I can see that normally what I would do would be to try to create a, a mental, a, 
a conceptual framework for how to explain why one should love people that are doing horrible things, why we might feel compassion for someone whose behavior is atrocious. But I don't want to, <laughs> because I see also that, and, and that is part of the job of the teacher, and it's part of what we will always do, is, is try to build the sort of like logical view of understanding why something, why, a true, why something that's just true might fit into your perspective of what should be true, and why that's like legitimately true. And why, yes, you should have these spiritual values because they fit into like how you think about the world and how we should be in the world. And there is a role, there's a place for that, but there's also a place where it's like the truth actually doesn't need an excuse. You don't need to defend the truth of why we have the ability to have love for all beings unconditionally, why the heart can care for the suffering of all beings unconditionally, how we can have joy for the joy of all beings unconditionally, while we might have total peace with things as they are. And not need to excuse it, not need to uh, fit it into our conceptual framework, because that is so much where we will keep trying to find security of like, okay, well, I can defend the Dhamma in, our, in my mind, because it's, it, it, here's the framework in which I'm holding that. And there's a place for that. I do it, we all do it. But there's a, another truth, which is deeper, which is like, it has nothing to do with your views of the world, of how we think about how things should be, whether we think whatever. I'm not even, gonna, I don't want to go down the path. It's like, it's just true. The heart can love. It's beautiful, this capacity. The heart can be at peace with things as they are, as beautiful or as horrible as they might be. And that is the truth. That is the Dhamma that we are practicing. And it has to be that, it's like that degree of like getting unhooked from how we're holding the world prison to our own views and our beliefs and our frameworks, which I have and I share with you. You know, I'm not saying their details are all shared, right? And I'll argue the days with anyone, my closest comrades, I'm sure I will argue endlessly about the minutia of where we disagree on certain points about things, you know, but it's like, it has nothing to do with this. And that's the power of this and why it's so disorienting and so powerful in this sense of like the, the everything, time, space, it's like, you know, the stars are not farther in your direct experience. The moon, the stars, the clouds, they're not any farther than your screen is from you, right? It's not to say that distance space isn't real. But in your direct experience, there is no difference. The stars are there, the moon is there, the clouds are there, the screen is there, the wall is there. It's all immediate. The only sense where something more or less distant comes in is in the concept of, well, what would it take for me to get there, to reach out to you, to get to that star? Yes, we, we then, we hold the world, we hold the universe to this perception of space. We hold the universe to a perception of time, right? Where in reality, our experience of it is like, there's no more distant past than another past. It's all just gone. There's no more distant future than the immediate future. It just hasn't, there's, what does Shinozagadara say? Let the future come to you. <laughs> Let it make its way to you. It's not there yet. There, all there is is this in terms of your direct experience. It's not to say time isn't real, space isn't real, atrocities aren't real. It doesn't mean that we don't engage those things in our lives and in our world and, and need to operate with those concepts. But to understand that there is a value, a Dhamma value to, to unhooking from them, to understanding and being willing to see how deeply um, beholden we are and imprisoned we are by our conceptual overlay of ourselves, of the world, of the universe, and the pain of that, the limitation of that, 
of course, the beauty of that, the compassion of that, the wonders of, of all that comes out of that, the creativity. We're not trying to beat that out of ourselves or out of human society. Of course, we operate on those levels. Of course, we have to attend to the fear that the heart has for loving unconditionally. That sense of vulnerability to the unrelenting, uncontrollable nature of things. We have compassion, we have care, we have patience with the heart that doesn't feel like it can always just be with things as they are, right? It's okay. We have to, it, it takes a long, I mean, longer than I, of course, I even have a concept of really, right? Of just like, and yet that's all concept. There's just right now, there's just what's happening right now in thought and body and sound and sight and smell and taste. That's all we actually have to work with. Do we have this ability to care for it, to be interested in it, to find room for just what's, what's happening right now? And engage that, that's the material we always have access to until it also disappears. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's just, you know, like, it is so important to, to be willing to see the relentlessness of, of views and concept um, of me, of fantasy, of, I, you know, all of this stuff. It's just like how much the mind is trying to create stability and, and, and solidity and, and uh, fixedness to things. And to see it as a prison, to see the pain of it, to see the dukkha that comes from it, to see the unskillfulness that comes from it, but also to have total compassion for it, total patience with it, understanding that the, the, it is so hard to just watch the breath. You know, it's so hard to, to just sit down and try to be vulnerable to this inundation of sense experience. Of course, we, we see the mind needs these crutches, needs these tools, needs these uh, places to find some stability in pleasure or in anger, uh, whatever it might be, right? To help us feel solid and strong and capable and you know all of these things. It's like, oh, don't wanna pathologize it. You have to have patience, you have to have care. But we also don't wanna be totally beholden to it. We need to have that sense of still being willing to see it, still being willing to see um, and give, and it's like hold ourselves capable, hold the mind capable of uh, deepening ability to be more and more with things as they are, to not be totally fixed in our attachment to identification, to identity, to view, to um, all of these frameworks, and to see the value that they play in our lives and the world and not reject them either. And in others, of course, right? The sense of like, oh gosh, of course, we're all doing this and how hard that can make the world and, and how hard it is when we really disagree with the perspective and views of others, but to understand the ways in which we are all so very conditioned in our particular ways and, and sometimes in group ways uh, around our perspectives and our views and how beautiful those can be and how limiting they can be as well. Mm. So we have a little bit of time. Um, if anyone has any questions, questions about your meditation practice, questions about Darine's instructions, questions about anything I've offered, um, we would love to be able to support you in, in whatever way we can. Um, uh, well, it's basically the, the, the easiest way for us is if you raise your Facebook hand, which I still think is for most people gonna be in that little reactions button on the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it's not there in an older system. You have to go to the chat or the 
participant screen and then click on more and there's a way to raise your hand. If it's hard, you can type something into the chat. We'll know you have a question and we'll call on you um, or just you know start flailing around and, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll catch you for sure. So yeah, we have some time if anyone has any questions. Hey, Kay, I think you can unmute yourself. Let's give it a, yeah, cool. Hey, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm noticing a lot of, I notice a lot of unpleasantness in general. Um, good thing or a bad thing. And I, I've been noticing that, oh, wow, it really, it really happens here, like Michelle was saying, and um, how I would like hit, hit like my toe in the corner of my bed, and it really doesn't hurt, but I really say ow, and <laughs> I keep going with um, riding that train, um, and and that's that's been wonderful <laughs> to notice that, and and then. I'm noticing that that the sensitivity to like pleasant and neutral is very it's not sensitive and I'm I'm not saying I should be sensitive or not um I'm just realizing that I I I lack in the capacity to notice that side of experience, but I have much, um, much, much more sensitivity to unpleasantness. Um, uh, if you have anything, I don't know. I don't want to seek an advice um, because that's what it is. Um, but I, I find it very interesting, like through Darina's interaction and um, Vedana and I'm, much, much interested in that. Darina, do you want to start? Yeah. I think that's it. It's just to really notice our tendencies and where perhaps we have some, some sort of identification. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. And of course, pleasant and neutral is there of course is there too and it's just it might be less loud and it doesn't matter the the point is that you're noticing and your relationship to unpleasant and how sometimes like jesse was saying that's the refuge of the heart that's where we feel uh we solidified and it feels less uh, is like a protection for the vulnerability in a way and it, I just thought of in one retreat that I, I told Michelle and perhaps Jesse that um, I didn't care about freedom, but I wanted it. It was just pleasure. That's it. Like it was so painful, but it was here we are like going to retreats and oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I want freedom for sure. I do want freedom. That's it. And when I'm on retreat, I just want pleasure. Cookie and the sight and the tea and the uh, freedom to no no it's too much to be with uh things as they are without controlling just this unconditional acceptance of what jesse was saying because it's changing and uh, we can't uh, grasp to anything and so we grasp in just like you were saying yeah sometimes you know pleasant anger can be a a, a good one right uh, or excitement or any anything so good job that's it that's what it takes <laughs> yay <laughs> thank you Kay. 
Totally. Yeah. I, I would only just add that you're, it's so cool that you appreciate it. You know, I mean, it's like just that you would say, I stub my toe and it doesn't actually even hurt that much, but I keep seeing that the mind is going back to it and that there's something cool in that. I mean, that's, that, that's so weird, right? Like who, who thinks that that's cool? It, but it is, it's amazing, right? It's just, just the fact that you are also appreciating that you're seeing it and that it's just like, it's wonderful. That's it. Yeah, very cool. Hmm. Let's see, Leslie. See, can we? I think you just need to unmute there. Yeah. Sorry. Great. <laughs> um, your talk really struck me because I've been wrestling with, I think, uh, my own similarities of what you were talking about, like Miramar and uh, atrocities there. And in this country, uh, the police thing and all that. And, and in one part of me, the bravery of the protesters that to me um, exude uh, bravery and change, uh, you know, without that kind of bravery, um, the, the silence um, has, has been ongoing. And um, with, uh, you know, having been a person of the sixties and I remember the protesting in the Vietnam War and like that, and and that did create uh, change. It it the tension, and so there's that part of me that has a hard time putting together what the inward, um, you know, putting out the meta, putting out the thing, and uh, I don't know, maybe you could. Um, comment on that because I I really do uh, believe that speaking the truth when of, of such atrocity or when you see that is it I see that as an important uh, element especially in this day and time absolutely absolutely yeah yeah I mean I for folks who know, me, there is a particular, restraint I have in this context, <laughs> in this role around just like flooding the space with like my perspectives on, on all of that, which is, which is basically, I'd say, you know, in general alignment, which is to say that at this, so, so what I'll say for myself with, let's just say like, the Burma piece of like, while that capacity felt to, to care unequivocally, right, feels entirely important. At the same time, all my energy is going into trying to overthrow the coup and and to have democracy actually be the, the way, you know, to help the protesters and help in whatever way we can with these things. I think we're and or like you're saying, Black Lives Matter and the incredible police brutality and, and, and institutional racism in this country, right? And the ways that play that continues to play out, and how important and valuable that is as human beings to be engaged in that and to be fighting for justice and freedom and liberty and all democracy and equality, all of these things that are like you know that I firmly and deeply believe in, and. I think that I have, through years of wrestling with it, I'll just say my own perspective, which is the, and, and it is not necessarily the most popular perspective right now in terms of like Buddhist activism, I would say, which is I, I really do feel like mindfulness isn't designed to change the world, actually. It's designed to unhook our own minds from greed, hatred, and delusion, and that there can be a social value to that. There can be a way in which, therefore, when we see atrocities, when we see horrors, we don't just kill the people we disagree with, that we have more mental space, we have more compassion, we have more connection to like all these beautiful qualities, and we find different ways of, of engaging conflict. And I do think that there is a potential social value to that, but it's not what it's designed for. 
And so why should we have the, our project of social change be something that we're trying to force the Dhamma to fit into? And I think that that's where I sort of am at this point in my own. So it's like a, as a, a kind of open answer at this point. And similarly, where it's like, I don't, my own happiness and liberation of heart isn't going to come from society. Like my, my help, and even if we live in a utopia, like everything is perfect in the world, we are still individually going to have suffering because social change actually isn't designed to undo the hooks in the heart. It can help, right? You, if everything was better, we'd all have like a better platform by which we could like do this work and we'd be less traumatized by racism and sexism and all the traumas and horrors that we live in. So it's not to say that they're totally unrelated, but to also see that they are a little bit different, distinct paths that are in interesting conversation with one another. So for me, it's like that conversation continues to be meaningful. And I don't think there's a prescription for it that I would want to lay on anyone. It's like, Yes, you know, it's like, where are we agents of, of freedom and goodness, love, liberation in the world? Where is there a need for our activism to have anger, right? Where is it actually need, where do we need to express like rage and upsetness with things? Because that's important as a social uh, ingredient to social change. Where is that create more? Where is that sort of entangling ourselves or not? I mean, there, there's like, again, I don't feel like there's a prescription for it, but I think it's like super important. And I, at the, I never would want to say that the answer is therefore, because we have our, because we can disconnect and unhook the capacity of the heart to be at peace and loving from the, reality of oppression in the world, right? It doesn't mean that we don't feel a sense of responsibility to the world. But I also do feel like there's a huge range of how we might go about it, right? That there's people who are gonna be more on the activist side of things, who it might be helpful to like touch back into like cooling out and finding like this deeper connection to caring versus just anger and the burnout. There's people who might be doing a sort of middle thing um, and then there's people who might be just sitting in a cave for 40 years. And there is still actually, that's important, right? Like we wouldn't have this tradition if there weren't people who have done that over the last several thousand years. If there weren't people who are just like retreating and being like, I need the seclusion to practice. And that, so that is still a value in this tradition and in this practice. And it isn't to say that there's anything wrong or unjust, uh, unrighteous about being engaged in the world. But it is also to say that there's, there is a complication that, that, that is hard, you know, the more we do it. I'm sorry, that was sort of a rambling response, but it's, I feel like it's a very important question. Well, that, 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 well, I mean, that wasn't, I mean, like you say, I don't think there is an answer, but what you said that there isn't an answer made me feel better somehow. Mm. <laughs> that that yeah, I think it's in your your own um, integrity of, of things, uh, and you know the importance to me is to um, not be in reaction. So I think with all that, uh, I think. It, following that inside of myself may be the right action. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Daddy, mm -hmm. anything you want to add to that? No. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. Amanda? Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. Um, I have what feels like maybe a kind of simplistic practice-based question, um, but also feels related to your talk today that I've had an experience and it was, it happened several times on the Christian Today where I, I get pretty focused and then the disorientation of, of um, like it almost seems like things kind of dissolve and then I feel dizzy and kind of nauseous. Like it feels like I just got off like a spinny ride at the amusement park and it feels like a real disincentive 
to focus. Like that starts happening and I try to stick with it. And then the mind comes back in and starts doing all of the, um, you know, conceptualizing and trying to figure it out and whatever. And, and I can see to some degree that that's what's happening, but it, um, curious if you have any advice for like how to stick with the, the focus when it feels so, um, it just feels not like I feel nauseous and dizzy in those moments. You start, Jesse. Me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so pure because it's like, there's a level to which it's like, do you, you know, do you have any suggestions of how to make things not the way I don't want them to be or whatever, right? It's just like, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, um, I do think it's important to hold out the possibility that that level of disorientation is more real than the experience of concentration that you had, that, that things are actually the concentration, it's this dance. It's always, concentration is a little bit of control, right? It's like, and it's, it's the, you're trying to control the attention to the degree to which it's supportive and creating enough stability to be able to observe how crazy everything is. And so there is this sense of like, when you, when the concentration, when you let it go or when it just runs out of gas or whatever, and you're thrust into just not having it, things are very disorienting <laughs> and thing and and so so that sort of level of sort of like dizziness and confusion and and tumult is um one could say a a, a not a more i want to be careful about that but certainly a direct a true experience of how things actually are and and without of course yes, super strong, maybe mindfulness or super strong uh, momentary concentration, right? Because you also want that sense of kind of the quality of concentration that we're developing that has that dexterity and flexibility that, that doesn't need to sort of always feel totally kind of like in the zone that has its also its strengths. And you can see why it feels like, oh, a kind of cocoon and a sense of stability and safety from which we're observing. Yeah, that's wonderful to have that kind of concentration. And we see how attached we get to it. We see how like, oh, that feels good. This feels bad because it's like crazy. And so therefore we think that the thing that felt better is a better practice. And I would say it's not necessarily, you know, that, that it, it's practice with different qualities that have arisen, but that it's, it's, it's um it's it, what you're seeing is also true you know and i just i think there's something important about why like you're saying it's a disincentive it's like exactly it's like it's partly why like when sandra asked last week of like why you know wanting a more regular practice and it's like we all have that thought we all want to we all know we should sit more than we do, right? It's like, which is true on some basic level. <laughs> like, like actually we all should sit more. Like there is a basic truth to that. And then of course, everything that Steve and, and Jake said yesterday, I was like last week was so beautiful and important to kind of go check back on if you haven't seen it or heard it. And you see, of course, the mind doesn't, we don't wanna, to put ourselves through this on a daily is, is like, disorienting sometimes and it's like of course we don't want to do this to ourselves and and it's easier to go on retreat it's like well maybe actually when you have like a, a longer period of practice it can feel easier to like okay you have that sense of protection to get quiet to sort of like observe these things and deal with all of the tumult but when it's in the middle of our day and we have other things we've just been doing or have to get to or then cook dinner or whatever it's like oh it can feel very disorienting and and it's not supposed to be mindfulness is supposed to kind of make us more better at everything right and it's like oh actually i feel nauseous when i get off the cushion and that's i think it's great i guess that's basically what i'm trying to say <laughs> i don't know how does that sound yeah i mean i i think um i guess part of what you said about like feeling the the pleasure of the concentration that part isn't there it's it's more like thoughts 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 concentration and then like whoa like hmm. kind of spinning like it's like things when the thoughts settle that's when all the tumult comes up i think that what you said about that maybe being more true 
to like reality than my stream of thoughts that seems totally true like that's that seems accurate um and i see the part of me that's like yeah but i want this to isn't this supposed to feel good like i want this to feel good if i'm doing the concentration thing um but it also um yeah it's, it just feels like a hard sell and maybe that's a lot of the path of like you know you know, like what Darine was saying of on retreat, like, I just want to think about the cookies. Like I, it's hard to not, to not go there. Um, but it feels difficult. Um, yeah, it just, it, it feels like a hard sell. Totally. It is a hard sell. Right. But, yeah. and, but I think, I think it's great. And I think that actually what you're saying is, is helpful of like getting understanding, like, it's not maybe just that the concentration dissipates, but that the concentration has built to a degree that you're seeing, you know, that it's a result of concentration, right? Mm -hmm. That you're actually, but that of course, then it's very destabilizing, disorienting. And um, it's why the Dhamma isn't for sale. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else, Darine, or should we go to Eileen? Just like, what? Sometimes when that is happening, I just say, oh, this is unpleasant and, and open up, like make a space for this because it is unpleasant. And of course, then we can just uh, have this uh, chain reaction, right? And, and this uh, embody <laughs> or, or whatever we, we, we do, right? Habitually. So just go back to sim simple, if you can, or oh, some pleasant and make a space, anchor, you know all this, but it's, it's good to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Eileen? I'm on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um. I guess I'm kind of with Amanda. I'm not getting the spinning out, feeling sick thing, but my my ability to focus feels so much less over time because of, and I'm in part feel like it's because of the global stress and fatigue of everything that we're bombarded with, with the pandemic and um, with all the racism stuff, with everything, like, and just to be so, even what you were saying, Jesse, about like that struggle of your own retreat and then tapping back in daily and connecting and then getting a little swirled off. So I guess I'm just feeling like I need more cookies, like Darine on retreat. I need, I need like the concentration practice more right now because it feels so out of balance of the, sure, I know that, you know, experience is coming at you a million miles an hour in every direction through all the sense doors is reality but for us to be able to sustain ourselves and be able to actually um, give to ourselves or be in the world in a way that's not just exhausting, it feels like concentration practice feels important right now. And I feel um, like I just don't practice it enough and I'm not sure what the best way to go about that is if it's like literally as a practice question commit more to concentration in each sit instead of doing the thing that i've often done in this practice which is move between concentration and open awareness and meta and it's like a bounce around a lot in a session and i, I would love to hear a little bit about just yeah if you need that um relief or you do want to strengthen your ability to be more concentrated. What what do you recommend practice wise? I'll start. Um, just to be aware of, uh, uh, I'm just gonna say it. Um, always about the motivation. Like, um, is this like I want to practice? <laughs> concentration it, you said like a, a refuge of course or a balancing and how do I say this um, 
one time I was talking to Molly, which is here, and we were talking about um, concentration, which leads, leads to uh, please or just uh, momentary uh, concentration, not the cocoon, but the momentary one that is actually is when you are seeing uh, the three characteristics, right? And, and I, I think I said, do you want um, wisdom or blizzdom? Blizzdom. And of course, it's a, my Mexican thing. And of course, we want this refuge in, we're searching for some stability and the cocoon in this uh, reality even if it's utopia, like uh, like Jesse was saying, even if it will be absolutely perfect society, we will want that because the suffering is in here. And so, I don't practice that. Uh, I don't reach for concentration, but I just make more space for this, uh, like snow, you know, this uh, snow that you shake, they're very like towels. And they, snow this, globe. Thank you. And just, it's like a, a out of, it can be out of a deep compassion, um, the space or out of um, wanting to understand or it will settle if you give it time, it will settle. And yeah, I don't know. That's a, as far as I can think. Just, just trust. You know it, Eileen. It will. It it just takes a little time. Um, give it space. Relax. Patience. And check the intention. The why. You know all of that things. And yeah, you're doing great. You have a great practice, Jesse. Yeah. No, I think it's. That's right. It's perfect. You know, the, the, of course, there is a totally legitimate understanding of the value of concentration of creating a kind of stability from which we can explore. And so I don't want to deny that or the kind of many traditions um, and, and even within our own that, that, that where there are periods of time where you may emphasize more a more concentrated approach to practice. So I think it's like, check it out. You know, if you, if whatever that looks like to you, if it's like cookie jhana, you know, where you're like, I'm just focusing on cookies, <laughs> whatever. I mean, I'd, I would be careful. I think it's an interesting unpacking of the cookie with the concentration. That's not exactly, you know, the pleasant, we need treats and we need pleasant experience. And that's a little bit different maybe, or it's a conversation to have about to what degree that has to do with concentration. The motivation, just like that, you said, it's like, are you doing it because you don't like what's happening and you want something else to be happening? And that's like baseline, basic. It's like, then that's not the right motivation. Or just to say, then, then it's just aversion and it's just clinging. And then you know that. What I want to say mostly is, is something I forgot to say in my talk, which is actually kind of like the whole point, which I wanted to say is like, the practice is not about following your breath. Like this might seem like a surprise, but it has like, it's, it's not about that, right? And so it's about observing whatever phenomena in its nature. And so that I think that if your mind is getting drawn to the mind, if you see that there is a lot of thought, a lot of, you know, uh, ideas, a lot of analysis, a lot of aversion or wanting, or it's like, try to observe the mind. It's part of what Darine is saying in terms of just creating more space. It's like, stop trying to follow the breath. Like stop trying to focus on the body or on sound. It's like, this is the predominant experience. Try to observe it and try to observe it not from aversion. I mean, or you notice the aversion and okay, but you try not to buy into it. It's like, can you appreciate that this is the way the mind is trying to get solid? This is the mind's response to not being able to handle the uncontrollability of things. Analysis, frameworks, thinking about this, opinions about this, ideas about this. And it's like, wow, it's incredible. And it's so convincing. 
that's what's so amazing. Part of what's so amazing about it is like, it's so easy to believe over and over again in one sitting that it's more important to think about this thing than it is to whatever, follow the breath or whatever. And so instead of trying to fight that, it's just like, oh, can we be interested in the heart? Can we appreciate the solidity that it's providing? And that's the thing. It's like, rather than rejecting it or pathologizing it or saying it's wrong or blah, blah, it's like, oh, getting anger makes us feel like solid. Wanting the, the idea of a future pleasant experience, it, it's creating a bubble of a future world that we like, oh, feel stable and that we're we're reaching towards right self meanness you know the sense of my happiness my blah 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 blah, blah my, whatever it's like oh you see that that is creating a platform for us that is obviously very compelling it, it, very addictive rather than trying to reject it or fight it or antagonize it can we just be interested you know can you try to see is like what is it to watch the mind do this over and over again it might you feel a little compassion might you feel like wow this is how overwhelmed it must be this is this the anger rooted in care the fear rooted in care the wanting rooted in care all of these things it's like oh yeah there's often a very pure motivation for all of this activity and can we find our way there through a non-judgmental uh, connected awareness so yeah, sounds sounds good. Thank you. You two are awesome. <laughs> okay, Quinn. We'll we'll wrap up with Quinn. There you go. Can you unmute? Let's see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Aloha. So uh, I just want to say uh, I had the same experience as Amanda in that uh, I might have moments of clarity and then uh, the mind becomes fuzzy and uh, disoriented. And uh, I used to be upset over it and then thoughts come up. And, uh, but lately my attitude was that it's okay. This is how the mind is. Uh, I cannot control it. Thoughts come up or sometimes I'm very sharp. Sometimes I'm very fuzzy. It's okay. I, I cannot control it. It's all right. And, and so I don't know whether it's I'm not interested or whether I'm equanimous over it. I, I don't really know. But for me, uh, the main thing is I'm not upset over it anymore. So I, I think maybe Amanda can just reflect on that. Yes. I, I have the same thing. The truth will just grind you down. Yes, that's that's how this works. All yeah. your resistance <laughs> and yeah. wanting things to be different. It's like at some point you might just accept it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great, Quinn. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. <sighs> well. Wonderful to be with you all uh, again today. Mm, thanks, Kalisha. Yeah, great. Yeah, no. It, it, <laughs> we want things to get clearer and clearer, and they can't. There are times where they're very clear, and sometimes it's just the the fog is very clear and the confusion is very clear. And that is also clarity, but it doesn't stop being foggy or confusing, you know? It's wonderful. It should be disorienting. It's hard to appreciate that, but it's like, oh, just the relief of actually not being able to fit reality into the little box and the little prison that we're trying to put it in. There's a part of it that's a relief for the heart. And so sometimes just, Trying to feel like where that might be in any moment uh, can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Daddy, any last words? Anything you want to offer? Um, just from the Kalisha, your comment. Um, everything is normal. Everything that that uh, everything really never question that, and everything that is arising, it is what it like I don't want to say we come up with shoots right this shouldn't be happening I know better or or uh, 
no, like really trust that whatever is arising, that's it, that's reality and everything is normal. So it's cultivating a relationship with what is there already. And that's why we practice. So <laughs> we're doing our best. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you next next Sunday. Feel free to say goodbye in the chat or on um,